Christians are just people who, you know, realize they need God. That's, that's the main difference. But it doesn't seem that in their worldview that there's much to distinguish them from the everyday atheist on the street. So if there is no God, then there is no ultimate truth or moral standards, and therefore it's up for grabs. You start saying things like, speak your truth instead of seek the truth. What fuels your passion for apologetics? Yeah, well, so, you know, Kirk Summit Ministries is really a force multiplier in the battle of tr over truth today. So we bring young adults to our Summit Ministries campus in Colorado and also in Georgia and have a curriculum courses for churches, Christian schools, homeschools, and others. So all in all, we're able to train a couple of hundred thousand people every year pretty intensively to understand a biblical worldview, to embrace God's truth, and then to champion a biblical mm. worldview, whether they're going into law, medicine, science, whatever they happen to be going into. So we, we throw around this word biblical worldview, this phrase biblical worldview. Um, what does that mean? Can you, what do you mean worldview? Yeah, I know it's, it is kind of a quirky term, but I, when, when I use the term worldview, I'm referring to a pattern of ideas, of beliefs, of convictions and habits. So we all have ideas. So for, just take, for instance, is there a God or isn't there a God? What you do in answer to that question will determine what you believe about what's real. I know that sounds crazy because people think, well, of course, reality is reality, but most people don't believe that. They believe they make up their own reality. What you believe about what's real will determine what you believe about what's right and wrong. Is it right or wrong if I just feel that it is, or is there some objective standard for what is right or wrong? That, in turn, determines what you believe about society and everything else. So what you believe at the outset ends up it's forming a pattern that affects all the rest of your life. It's not just Christians who have this. Mm. Everyone has a worldview. And by the way, Kirk, all worldviews are religious. You know, the dictionary definition of religion is any set of beliefs about the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe. I was on a show once with a guy who was an atheist, and he said, well, you're a Christian. You're making claims. I'm an atheist. I, I'm neutral. I'm like, oh, no, you are not neutral. Nobody is neutral in this. You have a very clear set of beliefs about the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe, and I challenge you to defend it. That was a really interesting conversation because most people just sort of put Christians on the defensive and think that if, they're, if they don't have belief, that they somehow escape the fact that they have a worldview. Jeff, you, you're expressing that as you're talking to young people, all over the country, that there is an erosion of truth. Why do you say that? We have passed a tipping point in the United States of America where the majority of people now say they believe the truth is not objective. It's not absolute. It's not knowable. Rather, truth is up to the individual. Once you say the truth is up to the individual rather than something that can be found, you start saying things like, speak your truth, instead of seek the truth. Mm. You start saying, well, that's your, you know, you've got these moral claims that you're making, but those are just your opinion. I have a different opinion. You have your truth, I have my truth. We'll just have to agree to disagree. And it, it sounds fine if you're just talking about, you know, whether you like chocolate ice cream or peanut butter ice cream. But when you get to issues about what should govern a good society, you can't have abortion through all nine months of the pregnancy and no abortion at the same time and in the same way. Those are two totally different policies. You can't have a 30% tax and 70% tax on the same group of people at the same time. You can't have fracking and no fracking. So you see, it, when it comes to the issues of the real world, you've got to make some claims and you've got to be able to defend them. Are they true just because you like them? Or just because you have power? Or just because you manage to shame other people who disagree with you? Or are they really, truly true because they represent what's actually real? And are you finding that people who say, well, what's true for you, it may not be true for me, we each can have our own truth, are, are, are there even Christians who, who are saying this? Unfortunately, Kirk, it, it actually is, it's just a little bit different in the church. So right now, we, we've found that the balance has completely tipped with those who are 40 years of age and younger. The majority of people 40 years and age and younger in the United States say they believe that truth is up to each person. Now, that's a, that's a really radical claim. Only radical philosophers in history would have ever made a claim like that. You know, Socrates would never have made that claim. Aristotle, Plato would never have made that claim. Even the atheist philosophers of the 20th century would never make that claim. 
Okay, because they know they believe there's some kind of way to reason through things. So I, I think I, I think that's really where it's tricky. So we looked at the church, and it's just a few points behind, a few percentage points behind. Christians really aren't that much different from the rest of the population, which I guess I should we should sort of expect that. Christians are just people who, you know, realize they need God. That's the, that's the main difference. But it doesn't seem that in their worldview that there's much to distinguish them from the everyday atheist on the street. And this idea that um, I can have my truth, you can have your truth, it sounds so compassionate, it sounds so um, inclusive, but... Um Throughout history, philosophers have recognized the importance of truth and tried to justify it or define it in different ways. What what are some of the different ways that uh, philosophers have defined or justified truth? Well, there are some different ways that they've justified the idea that there is no truth, and then there are some ways that they've justified the idea that there is truth. Mm. So when philosophers say there is such a thing as truth, what they're saying is that reality is objectively knowable, that when you look at something and I look at something, we may be seeing it a little bit differently from our different perspectives, but we're actually seeing the same thing that has an essence that presents itself in a similar way to both of us. This is this is manifestly true. It's true in morality. If you look at all the different moral codes all over the world, there are slight differences here and there, but they all have in common things like murdering someone inside of your group is never permitted. Uh, you, a man in some cultures may have more than one wife, but he may never have another man's wife. Cowardice is never elevated as a virtue. C.S. Lewis pointed out a lot of this, but there are many there are many anthropologists who've looked at it as well. They said the similarities are bigger than the differences. Even in music, which is crazy, you look at cultures around the world, they use similar chord structures and tones and so forth to evoke certain emotions. That's how philosophers say that there is no truth. Usually when philosophers say there's no such thing as truth, they're just saying, well, look, truth is whatever helps you win. You know, it's kind of a postmodern idea. Stanley Fish, a First, Man- First Amendment professor and postmodernist, said, you are entitled to your own facts if you can make them stick. Now, think about what he just said there. He's essentially saying that if you're more persuasive than the next person, then you're right. Is that the way we want to live? Is that the kind of society that we want to have? But I guess he's right if he presupposes the idea that there is no God. So if there is no God, then there is no ultimate truth or moral standards, and therefore it's up for grabs. And so it's sort of like the survival of the fittest, the one who can make his ideas stick more than the other. I know it, this, this sounds crazy to the people who are watching this right now because they're thinking, well, you know what? Uh, like I'm on the 12th floor of a hotel right now. If I jump out of my window, which opens, am I going to go down or up? Does it depend on whether I have feelings of upness or downness? No, it depends on gravity. So a lot of people are just thinking, this is crazy that people would have these kinds of beliefs. But uh, here's an example. Melville Herskovitz was a professor of education at Northwestern University. He wrote in the 1970s, even the facts of the physical world are perceived through what he called the enculturative screen. So you can't really know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. All you can know is that all of the people you've asked say that 2 plus 2 is 4. Yeah, this this starts to sound crazy, but it really is happening. And it's become this, this, um, this your truth and my truth uh, can be different truths as the base of our thinking. It's really showing up and leading to the kind of confusing things that we see kids being taught about gender, about morality, about all sorts of things. Um, you say in, in, uh, in some of your writings that people believe speaking their own truth leads to dignity and to harmony, but that you believe it actually leads to social conflict, purposelessness, and loss of identity. Would you help us understand how? I can prove that. You know, Summit Ministries, we do a lot of research, and you can see it. If you go to summit.org, click on press, you'll see some of the research that's there. 75% of young adults today say they do not have a sense of purpose that gives them meaning in life. 53% say they regularly struggle with anxiety and depression. 55% of young people today say they do not believe there is an absolute value to human life. You can take it or leave it, but you don't. But it isn't necessarily always the case that a person has the right to life. And so you, you just look at all these kinds of things and you think these are symptoms of a really lost generation. 
And if, if sometimes it's done on purpose, Kirk. I think we have to be honest about that. If you go to schools, if you can teach some, if you can teach children to look at one another and say there is no difference between a boy and a girl, then you can convince them of anything, and they become the perfect subjects for whatever you want to do if you're the one in power.